once I decided that I wanted to go big was a lot finding folks to align myself with that I could bring value to a team, but you know, lean on their experience. Hello and welcome to Pillars of Wealth Creation, where we talk about creating financial success with a special focus on business and real estate. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. Now let's get to it. Hello, welcome back to Pillars of Wealth Creation. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. With me, I've got Brian Ponnell. Brian, how are you doing today? Doing well, man. Doing pretty good. I appreciate uh, you having me on today. Absolutely. A little bit about Brian. He's the founder of New Day Capital. He's focused on syndicating value-add multifamily properties uh, alongside industry partners. Recently, uh, and I got to witness this firsthand, so it was pretty exciting. Uh, Brian closed his first multifamily deal as a primary sponsor uh, by purchasing a 138-unit acquisition in Austin, Texas. Um, and uh, that, that was fun to go through that deal because Austin, Texas, as most of you guys uh, that are listening, guys and gals that are listening, know it's a very hot market. Uh, it's a market that has got a ton of growth, ton of competition, of course, on multifamily. And uh, Brian and his partners were able to land a, a fantastic deal in that market. So it was, it was really fun to see. Uh, he's an LP in over 800 multifamily units, a commercial real estate fund and fund some hard money lending as well. So Brian is, uh, by his day job, is an oil and gas engineering manager with over 10 years experience focused in on asset management, acquisitions, divestitures, budgetary planning, and uh, private equity. And I'll let you kind of dive in more about kind of, you know, I guess your background what you're doing and where your focus is uh, in the uh, in the business side of it and the real estate side of it too. Yeah, I appreciate that intro, Todd. So yeah, originally from St. Louis, uh, went down to school at Texas A&M. And so like many others, found myself uh, entering the oil and gas space after a couple of years at school, um, made it back down to Houston uh, four or five years ago for work. So I worked for a public E&P company uh, that drilled and produced wells for about eight years and then left to go work for a private equity group uh, the last two years uh, as a startup and then recently moved jobs uh, to an investment firm that invests in the energy space in downtown Houston. So that's my day job on the real estate side of things. Uh, you listed out some of what I've been involved with. But uh, as you know, about a year ago to, to the day, last Thanksgiving, um, before that day, I knew nothing about real estate. I just thought it was uh, guys with you know, and gals that would buy houses and, and rehab them and get in there and do all this grunt work. And, uh, and so I had no interest, but I, I read a book over uh, the Thanksgiving holidays in 2020 about multifamily and really fell in love with the asset class. And since then, yeah, I've made several uh, passive investments and, you know, uh, God bless me. And we were able to uh, take down that Austin deal about one month ago. What book did you read? It was the ABCs of real estate by Ken McElroy. So it's a really good primer. Yeah. Easy read. Um, I mean, I literally just sat on my, my in-laws couch that weekend, uh, you know, throughout the parade and the football and just, it was just, you know, cranking through the 200 pages or whatever it was. It was a great starter. I, I think that might've been my first multifamily book as well. Uh, ABCs of real estate by Ken McElroy probably read it in the weekend. You know, it just like you said, it's an easy read. You just crank it out, but it's got a ton of good kind of got a, got a ton of good meat, but it's, it's just uh, easy to under, makes it easy to understand. So it was, a, it was a great one. So you didn't know nothing about real estate one year. I mean, this is, this is what people, I think a lot of people listening that want to get to into multifamily. Um, they want, they, they, think they have to go the traditional route and the traditional routes, the route I took buy some single family houses, you know, maybe buy some duplexes and gr graduate up to a four unit and then an eight unit and then a 12 unit and so on. Um, and then finally, you know, after many years of grinding and putting in the hard work, they'll be able to buy 138 unit, but that's probably, you know, six to maybe even 10 years down the road. Uh, but you said, that's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to skip all that stuff in between. And I'm going to go and buy a 138 <laughs> unit in Austin, Texas, a highly competitive market. Um, and do, 
and take the down. Take me through the reasoning behind that. Well, what? Why didn't you? Why didn't you just start buying a a single family home or a duplex? Yeah, it's a great question. It's really just, uh, I guess. I followed the mantra, success leads clues. And so what I did, I read that book over Thanksgiving and I started just calling, uh, you know, dozens of people in the space, yourself included. Um, but a lot of the big names you see out there in multifamily that are doing syndication, I wanted to know, A, just introduce myself, but really my, my goal was to figure out how do they get to where they were today and, you know, what would they do differently? And I'd say, you know, if you looked at those conversations, I don't know what percent, but at least 90% or more of the people there, you know, mention that they started small and if they were to do it again, they want it, you know, that you, you often hear from people that, you know, maybe a four unit is just as hard to, to get under contract and close as a hundred unit um, because you still have to go through a lot of the same legal documents and, and DD, et cetera. And so I just, you know, I, I looked at that advice and it was, it was so prevalent throughout all the conversations that I said I was going to really skip that step. And I wasn't necessarily in a huge rush either. I didn't feel like I have to get a property. So I'm going to, you know, look at two to four units. It just, for me, you know, was um, financially secure in my, in my current job. And so to me, like to be worth my time, I wanted to go big. And if, you know, and the bigger properties also just played into my background in oil and gas, which you start thinking about, uh, these properties really as individual businesses. And so, you know, all the buzzwords, economies of scale and everything else that go, you know, all the other benefits of larger properties really spoke to me. Well, I think you mentioned, you said something there uh, that is key is the properties are individual businesses. And if you start to look at it like that, like you're not necessarily buying a 138 unit multifamily, you're buying a business that happens to have 138 units in it, right? That's that's what the business is, but you're buying a business, you're buying an individual business. And if you, when you look at it like that, I, I think that in my opinion, that kind of changes um, how scary it might be. It changes just the whole, um, the whole attitude around it. Yeah, I'd say the second thing, you know, on the fear part, um, yeah, if I, if I was to do this alone, there's no way I would have gone and done the 138 units. It was, you know, around a $6 million equity raise. Um, and I would have, A, even if somehow I had $6 million of, of friends sitting here <laughs> with us in this conversation, which, you know, I do not, but, um, you know, I'd be fearful that I would have made a mistake on my, on my first deal or even, you know, a second or third deal. So, you know, the other part of that was, once I decided that I wanted to go big was a lot finding folks to align myself with that I could bring value to a team, but, you know, lean on their experience. So let's talk about that. Right. To, Cause still, even with a team, 138 unit for your first deal, it, that that's big. Right. So let's talk about how did, how did you go about finding people to be on your team and i guess i guess let's start there how did you go about finding the right people to be on your team you know that's a great question um for me you know clearly the majority of people that are doing this full time that have been doing it let's say seven to ten years or more likely have a team of people built out around them an office of folks there wasn't gonna be a lot of value i could bring so i was looking for somebody or you know I should say some folks that had call it five-ish years of experience or less that had, you know, multiple at bats at multifamily syndication, but still all of us have, you know, 24 hours in a day. So they were going to have pinch points. And so with my background in oil and gas and on the deal flow side, I felt confident day one, underwriting deals, uh, working through large data sets, being able to streamline processes and data analysis. And so if I could bring that to the table, you know, I felt confident that I could, you know, sit there equally with them as partners, um, but bring value to them. And so what I did was, you know, during that time frame in December when I was in January, when I was reaching out to a lot of folks that are doing syndication. Um, you know, a couple of them, we would go get coffees or breakfasts, lunches, and we'd really hit it off. And those were much more fruitful conversations than some of the uh, Zoom meetups and, you know, other types of networking I did. And so that in-person relationship 
you look at a couple of deals together and then you're able to leverage that relationship down the road for uh, something like this Austin deal. Yeah, I think one of the things that really impressed me with with what you did, first of all, you got educated very quickly, right? You found something, you had a passion for it quickly. You said, this is something I want to do. And you educated yourself very quickly and you took it very seriously. Um, When I would say, Brian, read these three books and get back to me in two weeks you get back to me in three days and go, I've read three, those three books and three more. What else, what else can I do? You know? (laughs) Mm -hmm, Uh, mm -hmm. So, so that was very impressive. But the other thing that I think when you, when I look at those who have a lot of success starting from really nothing to going big, like what you did is they leverage other people and they leverage their skill set and they're not worried about people rejecting them. And I think a lot of people get so worried about, I'm going to call these people all, how will they perceive me? I don't have any experience. No, you said, I don't have any multifamily experience, but I've got experience. I'm good at running processes. I'm good at looking at deals and analyzing data. That's what I can add to the table. And I got to tell people that and I got to tell them, this is what I add and this is how I can become part of your deal. And let's do some business together. And I don't correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, did you, did you, was there a lot of, was there, when you're having these conversations, um, let's just take even the, the, the guys you partnered with on this deal or other people that you talked with, was there a lot of, um, that fear of I'm not good enough, that fear of, um, I don't have anything to offer or were you just, were you confident going, I'm, I've got things to offer. You know, that's a fascinating question. And I'll pull back the curtain a little bit because when it came to that specifically, uh, I guess I just naturally have confidence. I like to lead. Um, and so I don't ever remember a time where I was afraid to talk to a fellow sponsor GP or broker. Uh, the fear began to, to pop up when I, started to consider, okay, how am I going to communicate to my network that this is something I'm interested in? And that was a huge mental block. And as far as like you know, maybe even you're talking raising money or uh, even before then. So, you know, I'll give you an example back in, you know, Jan one, again, just a month after I read that book, I uh, submitted the LLC with Texas and, and, st- and started to set up a website. And as and part of that education, after you read that book, yeah, your, exactly. Your LLC, you got yeah, your- I had conviction, right? Um, and you I mentioned mean- the education part, but what I think is also important is that people don't get paralyzed and just decide, hey, I need to educate myself for 12 to 18 months. I mean, if anybody's ever been to school, you realize that actually doing whatever you're learning about is completely different. So yeah. to me, it's a continual education program rather than I need to educate myself and then go do. And then go. Yep. Yep. But to answer your question, yeah, so I, I stand that up as part of that process. I start to put together like an ebook, if you want to call it that. I mean, it was really, you know, some thoughts I had about why I believed in multifamily mm. and, um, you know, got a CRM, a free CRM or whatever. And I probably spent four or five weeks just sitting there waiting to hit send to like maybe 50 people, you know, maybe even 20 people at that time. Um, and I don't know if it was just fear that I wasn't going to succeed or fear to admit that I was really just jumping out there and trying something new. Um, But I'm definitely my biggest critic. Right. And maybe that was the other part of it It was like that pack. It wasn't perfect. I didn't have line of sight to a deal. And so I just flounder for 12 to 18 months and people would watch me. And so that, you know, was something I really battled with for quite a while. So when you finally hit send, what was the reaction with, with those 50 people or whatever it was on that list? Yeah, it's been, you know, it's, that's been probably the most enjoyable part. And so that I, I still remember that first, you know, tranche of folks I sent, or maybe it was the second tranche. The first was like very small friends and family. It was like, you know, the people I trusted most of my life and, you know, got some feedback. You sent it to your wife and that was it. Yeah. My <laughs> wife, you know what? I, I think my, my wife probably won't listen to this, but she never read the packet. I'm still mad at her. About that today. <laughs> but, um, you know, 
when I sent the second round a couple of weeks later, uh, I had a guy that I used to work with at that oil and gas company that now was traveling the world for like two years over COVID. He had, you know, taken, I guess, a sabbatical and we had, a, he was in Australia at the time and we ended up talking about uh, life and mindset and real estate for an hour at like 4.30 or 5 a.m. one morning. I was down in Florida on spring break and and so reconnecting with people like that, and you know, I'll give you another example. Uh, after we closed this deal, I posted on uh, LinkedIn last week, and I had a high school colleague uh, that I hadn't talked to in, God, was, I guess I graduated 14 years ago. And that, we got on a Zoom call like this, and it was the first time we talked in 14 years. Um, and he does commercial real estate and was just fascinated to hear more about the multifamily space. And so those type of reconnections, um, and those conversations have been really enjoyable. Yeah. Yeah. Pa pausing to hit the, the uh, send button, I think is something that most of us can relate to. I can re still remember that first newsletter I sent out. I was just like, oh, this is too much. how many, I'm going to get, everybody's going to unsubscribe. <laughs> <We all have laughs> hear what I have to say. Like, why am I sending this? Um, but it's amazing when you finally do hit send and, and the reaction of of a lot of people are is pretty positive and the connections that you the reconnection some of those reconnections you make it's like wow i didn't even they didn't know you were doing this but you didn't know they were doing you know like the commercial real estate guy i didn't even know that like that's really cool now we got a good connection so that's yeah awesome. exactly yeah i mean i'll give you one last example i had a fraternity brother call me um he got on my list and him and his dad had some money they wanted to put to work after selling a single family rental and we probably talked for like two hours and, you know, we used to be fairly close in college, but I hadn't talked in a couple of years and he ended up investing, you know, six figures plus in, in this Austin deal. And so, um, yeah, it's been really interesting. That's great. That's great. Yeah. I mean, again, the getting educated, but I really like how you said that getting, getting educated, you know, we all, a lot of us went to college and you learn all this stuff and then you get to the job and you're, you're not even trained for it. You gotta, you gotta completely go through all this training because what you learned in college really barely applies to anything, maybe a little bit, but you have to actually start taking that action. And that's something you did very quickly. You set up your LLC right away. You started making phone calls to people right away. Even though you hesitated to hit the send button on your first newsletter, you wrote the ebook and you ended up hitting send fairly quickly. Um, to people and, and you were submitting letters of intents on deals, underwriting deals. Uh, you're taking those action steps while you're still educating yourself at the same time, um, which in my opinion is the reason why you were able to buy your first hundred plus unit deal in less than a year from the day you started. There's, that's rare. Most people don't do that. Most people that have been doing this business for uh, you know, let's call it duplexes and maybe even 20 unit buildings. When they decide to transition, they take more than a year because they're worried about educating themselves only and then taking action later. That's a great point, Todd. And I think a lot of people, you know, <clears throat> worry about educating and then, um, and then wait to take action, or they feel like they've got to become the expert in everything. And I, I did that to a degree the first month or two where, I felt like I needed to be talking to brokers, underwriting, talking to the property manager, just doing everything right. Um, and when the switch in my head went to like, oh, no, to back to your point a few minutes ago, I'm going to leverage other relationships. I didn't really become too concerned about what was in some of the legal documents for this awesome deal. You know, I, I read through it, but I was trusting that I had one of the best lawyers in the space on it. You know, when we did DD, I mean, that working at W2, that could have been so overwhelming, but we had a, a strong property manager there headquartered in, in Austin we were working with. And so um, I, I had to get comfortable trusting others. And that was a little difficult for me, just my personality. I, you know, I really like to, I guess, type A, dig into everything. But once I became comfortable, like, okay, you know, person X ha has got this covered and I just totally want to even, you know, look at the email. Uh, you can get a lot further faster doing that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I can still remember when I first uh, started, this was prior to, I was not buying large multifamily, but I was calling on it and I wasn't ready at all to buy it. And I, well, I had the fear um, that I wasn't whatever, I don't know, good enough, whatever it was. I, I just, I wasn't there. 
yet, but I remember calling brokers trying to take action and, and talking with one broker and he goes, you don't really know what you're talking about, do you? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yeah, uh, you know, yeah, pro- probably not. Uh, but it's just taking that action. You know, I, it, it was for me to get to the point where I was ready to buy, I had to start taking those steps. Otherwise it just wasn't going to happen. Like you said, reading books is great, but um, all right. So let's move on, Brian. What, you, you know, you closed on this one deal. That's great. You had uh, a couple partners on it and um, you guys are, I, I know now focused on that asset management and, and implementing your business plan. What next? What, where, what are your, you know, are you, are you looking for another deal? Um, what are you doing right now? Yeah, so twofold, you know, for our current investors, you, you nailed it. I'd say that uh, we're definitely focused uh, on this first month on the asset management. We've got three and a half million dollars of capital on this project. And so we're having twice a week calls. One dollars of in that you're going to put in for improvements on the capital. Yep. yep. Okay. And so about half of that is a little nuance of the of the deal. We need to restore a, a building that had fire damage um, mm-hmm. about a year ago, but um, but it's still a hefty amount. And so there's a lot of capital bids to, to sort through and get those projects uh, you know, kicked off. And so we're having two calls a week. Uh, wrote our first investor update and I actually took the lead on that um, about two days ago and sent that out for November. And so there's a lot involved there, but we've got a good team in place. Um, but clearly, you know, what I've told people is we all celebrate getting these deals on social media and to friends and family. And when you're on the outside looking in, uh, I found myself getting jealous a lot of people and thinking, well, if only I had 50 hours a week to dedicate to this. But in reality, that's just step one. I mean, now it's time to go execute a three to five year business plan. And so, you know, I'm a, I'm a baseball, big baseball guy. And so it's like, we just put the ball in play, but we got to go run the bases and see if we can score. And so, uh, you know, that's number one. But yeah, number two, I, you know, I, I'm very hungry for the next deal. I th- that day we closed on the Austin deal. I actually right. submitted an LOI on another property, just kind of give you the idea of like, I wasn't sitting there celebrating, um, you know, I was hungry for the next one. And that's really where I found myself. Um, there's a lot, a lot of people that, uh, you know, have congratulated me and said, oh, this is huge. It's over hundred units, but um, I find myself a, still a little empty and, and hungry for the next one and trying to figure out, okay, how do I scale beyond this? Yeah. Well, you're, you're committed to growing a business. And I think if you're committed to growing a business, one deal, although it's a, it's a win is just a, a small step, right? It, it's, yeah. a, it's a step in the right direction. And most people would look at it and go 138 units, not a small step, but for where you want to go and what you want to do, this is a small step and you're going to continue to take small steps to get to where you want to go. And like you say, you got to celebrate that win, but there's still a lot of hard work. You just put the ball in play. <laughs> You haven't even you haven't even reached first base. Like you, you've got to start uh, implementing that business plan. You have investors' money that's counting on you at this point in time, and uh, you guys have to implement the business plan. How do you what are what are you doing with your current business partners? Have you guys set up systems? Have you set up uh, roles and responsibilities? How did you decide on how that all works? That's a really funny and timely ask that we actually got jumped on a call yesterday. Uh, so there's out of the uh, five or six GPs, there's really three that'll be on the asset management, uh, me and, and two others. And so, you know, um, we probably hadn't done the best job and we were about a month in and we, we decided to jump on the phone and have a little bit clearer discussion around that. But, um, you know, I'll just give you it from my point of view. For me, it's like, look, look, as we start off this conversation, I don't have real estate experience. I walk onto an apartment and I'm oversimplifying, but it, if I walk onto an apartment property, I'm like old, old property, run down, new property. Nice. You know, I don't have the eye for things. If we got a bid in for new roofs and it was $260,000, um, is that a good price? Is that a bad price? Uh, how do you guys usually handle security patrol? I mean, just all these nuances of property management. And so I was very upfront. And I guess that's the other thing, like be transparent with where your weak points are. I was like, look guys, I don't want to make those calls. Uh, I'll be on the, you know, I'll be on the email chain on a call with you guys. If there's a time, I'll give my two cents, but where my value more than likely can be is tracking some of the KPIs. I work 
I worked extensively with our property manager and went through like four or five rounds of the budget once we closed for 2022. Uh, I'll likely take the lead on writing monthly investor updates. Um, and just, you know, little things that help make it a smoother deal for all of us. So like I set up a Microsoft Teams channel for all the GPs and broke it into the asset management where we could store all the files in the cloud and share them, but also have that be the way of communication. I just think it's a lot more efficient than emails or, or, or phone calls and text. And so I'd say I'm more like the data guy and, and probably the, the finance guy. Uh, whereas the other two gentlemen will take more of the lead on the on the GC and on the uh, day to day uh, asset management. Yeah, so I mean, and that's really important to understand, and it's good mm -hmm. for you guys to have had that sit down and say, "Look, we got to really align ourselves and make sure we all have our specific roles." And and you're right. I mean, just being open with people. A lot. Of, I think a lot of people want to just assume they can do everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I can do everything. I just don't do everything very well if I try to do it all, right? Um, you could probably figure out how to do everything, but why, if you're really good at some things, why try to figure out how to be the construction manager if somebody else on your team is? And so so really understanding your role and responsibility, uh, I think that that's huge. Um, all right, so awesome story. I, I just, I love talking with people like you that find, have a goal and just go after it. It's a, it's the tenacity. Uh, you have the, what I would call the it factor is you, you saw the vision and you said, this is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to completely take action. And you, you're not superhuman. You have your own fears and doubts, but you're not letting them get in your way. When those come up, you're trying to figure out how to get rid of them. So uh, lo love these stories. Brian, Brian what, what would you say? Well, we've already maybe hit on some of these, but what would you say are maybe three key factors in your success, three key factors. Yes, yeah, so I'll steal a little bit of what you just said. Uh, number one for me is just this this flame that can't be quenched. Like you've got to just have a burning passion to succeed, uh, whether that's multifamily or anything else in life. Uh, you know, being the best father you can be, being the best you know servant to society, whatever it is. Like you just that. If, if you feel like you're not giving a 10 out of 10 effort on any given day or hour, that's got to bug you. And that's, you know, something that for me, uh, I'm just, I'm, I guess I'm never satisfied at times that could be a negative, but at the end of the day, that's really driven me to where I've gotten today in multifamily. Um, number two would be avoiding the shiny object syndrome. Um, I guess that goes a little bit into what we've touched on, which is don't try to do everything. But, you know, back in February, uh, when I started underwriting deals and you're looking at, okay, how do I do market analysis? And, you know, I sit back like everybody else in this nation. And uh, I think to myself, well, the Sun Belt's a great place. Every, everything's blown up in the Sun Belt. And so there'd be one week where I was underwriting a Phoenix deal because Phoenix is on fire. And then the next week it was Austin. And the next week, well, I'm in here in Houston. I might as well do Houston. It seems to be a better price. And I was just, <clears throat> bouncing all around the, the really the lower 48 um and that wasn't going to get me anywhere same thing like okay i'm, I'm going to call brokers i'm going to underwrite i'm going to try to think about my brand it's like no i gotta pick a lane and so that's tough to do because you can feel like you're missing out especially in this day and age you know the whole fomo but pick a lane run at it hard if you need to give yourself a goal say i'm gonna run at this hard two to three months and if you if you look back and you, and you can definitively say you're not making any progress then at that point make adjustments but it's a tough game to be in it's going to take you know 100 deals to look to review to, to get one and so you can't just give up after two weeks either and then i guess the third piece of just you know have a solid foundation and rock of why of you of the bigger why why are you doing this because you know it did take 100 
deals to get this one in Austin. And there's a lot of days as I've seen people celebrate uh, putting deals under contract on Facebook or Instagram that I was just like, look, I, I can't do this on the side. This just isn't going to work. And I just kind of wanted to give in, you know, I was like, this isn't fun anymore. Uh, but you have to step back and be like, I've been doing this four months. And then also like, why am I doing this? And it wasn't, you know, the number, yes, the financial payoff is great, but that, that can only carry you so far. And so it had to be a bigger reason. And for me, it's been the impact we could have on these local tenant communities. And then that wealth that I could generate from the investment and also from, uh, you know, the GP uh, fees and everything would allow me to put aside, you know, uh, a portion of that and, and donate that to charity. So when we close this Austin deal, um, my wife and I actually set up a, a charitable trust foundation with uh, Charles Schwab. And, you know, I took uh, 10% of that acquisition fee and put it into there and something I'm really excited about. And so um, I'd say those are the three main pieces. That's awesome. Um, you know, I think that shiny object syndrome and or, or whatever you want to call, you know, fear of missing out, all, all that kind of stuff. I think a lot of people think they, they don't realize how much time we really have. Like you don't have to buy that first multifamily in less than a year. Like Brian did, you don't have to buy it in the first two years. Like if you're taking the action that you need to, don't worry about how long it's taking you. Don't worry that Brian did it in less than 12 months. Like that can't be how you're looking at things. You can't be time constrained. You can't be worried about Oh, I saw this person posted on social media, like, oh, geez, I'm never going to let it happen. Um, because that, that will get you down. Like use social media as a motivator. Don't use it as, as the opposite. It can be very <laughs> unmotivating sometimes when you look at it and go, geez, these people are buying so much. Why am I not? Yeah. And you start to criticize and, and make up these narratives in your head. Like they must be overpaying and, and maybe they are right. It's a crazy market. That's a whole other podcast, but, uh, you're right. We should, I think it's best to celebrate everybody and use it as motivation. Indeed. Yep, yep. Um, to get to the next level. Um, you know, and again, this probably goes back on the success. So, so maybe some of it's the same, but is there, is there any like big things that, that helped you get there? Any tools, any, um, I don't know, what, anything that helped you get to that next level or, or get the confidence or, you know, whatever, whatever it was. Yeah. So I'd say that's a good question. Um, you know, I think there's different tools out there. You know, for me, the majority of my work was on the underwriting side. So I'll probably have come from it from that angle. Um, but tracking the results of your underwriting in a consistent basis for me i was using Airtable, which i saw that an established group was doing or like monday.com setting up a teams channel with some of the folks that i was looking at deals with so that we could have a very clear communication and you know easily share files on the cloud um those are like these little nuggets that nobody tells you about you're not going to read about in a book but that make a world of difference because if you're just one-off underwriting and throwing them on your desktop or whatever um, it's not gonna be very efficient versus you know me where we've looked at you know maybe 170 deals at this point and they're all on a table i kind of know what the that kind of i know what the you know gna and the marketing and all these line items were for each of those deals and i have them on a map if i wanted to i could go pull up the closest deal and try to refresh myself oh yeah that's what we were thinking on this one right and so i think uh, if you can build out systems especially in this day and age where data is so valuable uh, that's going to make you a, a stronger underwriter and, you know, multifamily syndicator. And then, you know, and just trying to, I guess, level up then there. So that, that's more of like the logistical side of things. And then the other piece is just the mindset. And there's just, at the end of the day, there's no benefit to being fearful. So when I'm making those first calls to brokers back in February, I really didn't care, I guess, if I sound like a fool. And I'm sure there was times I did. I, I, I don't remember a specific example, but I do remember being asked questions. I didn't even know what it meant. You know, I just had no idea. Right. But uh, my goal was to try to create a personal connection with them. If they told me they were having a boy, oh, well, my wife and I are also pregnant. We're going to have our, you know, and it was trying to create those connections with, with uh, those guys and gals and, 
um, you know, the knowledge would come later, but to show you often hear, but I believe it's a strong piece of advice when you're talking to brokers using that example, um, you know, be true to your word. So, you know, my mantra was if we were looking at something they, they sent over and I said, okay, I could get this out in 48 hours. Cause I know I can underwrite quick then get back to me within 48 hours with feedback. Even if I was way off, I'd be like, here's why, it, you know, and give them kind of three reasons. And so I think that helped. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. The, the communication with these brokers or anybody, I mean, that sets you apart. If you can communicate, it sets you apart massively. So figure out yeah. who on your team and how on your team you guys can communicate. And you, you're going to be completely set apart from everybody else because that's, that's massively lacking. Um, yeah, no, I agree. So, um, all right. So Brian, um, I want to wrap up. I got a couple last questions for you. What's your favorite book? Favorite book. You know, I, man, I've read a lot this year. I'm going to go kind of outside of a lot that we hear about. There's a book by uh, these two behavioral psychologists that got into, uh, you know, what you call here called behavioral economics. And it's called Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. And that is a fantastic read. It's pretty dense. And so if you want, you know, more or less a summary of that, Michael Lewis actually wrote a book that summarizes it. I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head, but that's fascinating it really goes through the different human biases and why you believe what you do and kind of how your brain works. And I, I think it's a great read for anybody to challenge your biases at whether it's your W2 job or, you know, while you're doing multifamily or, or real estate. Awesome. All right, man. Last question before we wrap up, what are your three pillars of wealth creation? Three. Yeah. What are my three pillars of wealth creation? Remind me what the, what the, uh, you knew I was going to ask. This. I know. I, I, <laughs> I know people, I know people have gotten different angles on this. Yeah. You go, whatever angle you want, whatever comes up, you know, a lot of people answer, uh, the, you know, real estate and that type of stuff. A lot of people answer mindset. So. Yeah. So I think for me, uh, again, probably pillar number one is that foundation. And so it's your, it's your why I believe the most successful people have been able to generate wealth, have a, have a larger why. And for me, that's really societal driven. You know, we've got a short time here on earth and, and faith driven. Um, number two would be teamwork. I just don't think you can generate, you can build a lot of wealth without a strong team. Um, there's a lot of people that are doing this individually and multifamily and if you look over the long haul, they're just not going to get as far as people that have a, a strong team built around them. And then the, the third pillar of wealth creation would be, you know, really education. Um, you know, we, we talked about don't get paralyzed by it, but find yourself a good mentor. Again, that kind of goes back to like the team and just continuously learn. You know, I'm trying to read something every day about uh, multifamily real estate to make me better in, in this job. Brian, how can our listeners get in touch with you? Learn more about what you got going on and connect. Yeah, I appreciate that, Todd. So uh, just look me up on LinkedIn or, or Facebook, Brian Ponell, and then my website for New Day Capital is www.newdayinb.com. If you jump on there, we've got a free ebook called The Power of Multifamily Investing. Awesome. awesome, awesome. We'll put that in the show notes so people can connect directly with you. Brian, really appreciate it. Thanks so much for joining us. A lot of great info, a super inspiring story. So really appreciate it. I appreciate that, Todd. It's been a pleasure getting to know you this year and that was fun. Hey, thanks so much for listening. I appreciate you being a loyal listener. Say, I would love to have you go on to our Facebook page and subscribe, uh, give us a thumbs up, go on to iTunes or wherever you listen and give us a rating and review. Don't forget to subscribe your radio review just helps us push this out to more and more people and continue to grow our audience and hopefully positively affect a ton of people out there that really need this and, and want this so uh, the other thing I've got for you is a free ebook on my website so go on to venture properties.com venture properties.com 
and download our free ebook on real estate and on syndication. And I've got some data points in there, some really good stuff for you. So I'd love to have you take a look at that. It's free. I'm not expecting anything from it. Uh, and, and also, look, if you want some help in multifamily, want some help learning, growing, getting your business off the ground, I would love to talk to you about what it would look like uh, to work with me potentially and see if that's a good fit. So you can go up to coachwithdex.com and check that out and uh, we can definitely have a, uh, a call. Thanks a lot for listening. You make it a fantastic rest of the day. I'll catch you on the next episode.